Tonight on The Best Times, we examine whole body donation, a choice that represents the ultimate gift to science. We'll have some fun with the latest trend, adult coloring books. And you'll learn to listen to your heart. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. Previously on this show, we've dealt with the subject of funeral arrangements and the alternative choices that boomers are adopting. One such choice is whole body donation. For some, it represents a final altruistic gesture. For others, it's an economical alternative to the high cost of today's funerals. But whatever the motive, the medical community views whole body donation as the ultimate gift. This is a robotic surgical system. The high-tech robot arms are so precise, they can literally peel a grape and then stitch it back together again. An amazing feat. But the real wizards behind the curtain here are the trained physicians using their knowledge and skill to perform delicate surgery through impossibly small incisions. The expertise to operate this device has come from years of training. And part of that training from anatomy class in medical school to continuing education in surgical practice has involved the dissection of human bodies. Historians can trace human dissection as far back as the Greeks in the third century BC, but the practice didn't become common until the 14th century in Europe. Some of Leonardo da Vinci's most famous drawings came from his observations of anatomy class at a local hospital. The earliest source of subjects for human dissection came from unclaimed corpses, mostly prisoners. As the science of medicine grew in the 19th century, the demand for human cadavers began to outstrip the supply, which led to the notorious act of grave robbing. But by the turn of the century in America, many states had enacted laws to govern the acquisition and donation of human bodies for medical science. Today, most anatomical bequest programs exist on college campuses, such as the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. We use approximately 150 to 200 specimens per year, uh, and we teach medical students, dental students, uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists, some nurses, and a number of other individuals that need to learn basic human anatomy as a part of their ability to then go out and uh, be good healthcare professionals in the state of Tennessee or wherever they end up. The UT Anatomical Bequest program has been in operation for 65 years. Donor bodies are used for a period of six months to two years. In spite of the advancement of computer-aided 3D simulation, Dr. Nelson insists that nothing can replicate the hands-on experience of using a real human specimen. The ability to develop that eye-hand coordination, the ability to actually palpate the difference, to feel the difference between an artery and a vein, to understand that nerves and arteries can look quite a bit alike, but you can feel the difference, to understand the course and the complex three-dimensional relationships as vessels and, uh, and nerves uh, go from the center part of the body out into the fingertips is something that you can't really duplicate in any sort of model because it is so complex that you're certainly going to miss some of the facets that it will be very very important and could conceivably be crucial in saving somebody's life. 
Not far from UT's Medical Center campus sits another facility that accepts whole body donations. The Medical Education and Research Institute, or MERI, has been in existence since 1992 to serve the continuing education requirements of practicing medical professionals. Their Genesis program provided over 700 donor bodies last year to feed the Institute's growing demand. There is a great need because if you think about how much medicine, surgeries, technology evolves on a daily basis, it's just absolutely incredible. So you always need to keep up with the most recent surgeries. And also here at the Mary, we work with many device, medical device companies. And so they're always trying to make improvements. So for instance, if they have a total knee joint, you know, they're trying to improve the function of it. They may come here with a surgeon, uh, engineers, and they may actually draw up the new product actually place it in one of our donors to see if it works like they had hoped. You know, are they getting the right range of motion? Are there any problems? And if there, if there are problems, they, they are able to work on those until it becomes perfected. This is a clinical education class for flight nurses and paramedics at Hospital Wing Air Ambulance Service. They are reviewing the latest techniques in stabilizing a patient for the flight to the hospital. Part of their training takes place on a medical mannequin, but nothing can replace the knowledge gained from performing even basic intubation procedures on a human body. Mary also provides an education and research platform for medical device companies to test their newest instrumentation and for physicians to learn the latest cutting edge surgical procedures in an atmosphere that replicates the experience of the operating room. The whole idea of body donation is that we need to learn how to do procedures here so that when the physician walks into the OR, that's not the first time he's ever done it. So we see every person who donates their body as taking our place of being that first patient. Although no accurate statistics exist, it's estimated that about 20,000 people per year donate their bodies to programs across the country. Contrast that with over 100 million people who are organ donors, and it becomes clear that as medical technology continues to advance, the need for whole body donors will become critical. But should you consider whole body donation, and why? The individuals feel like they are contributing to generations to come hoping that by training these uh, young professionals in healthcare, that they will then go out and because of the knowledge they gain from um, their experience, perhaps save, let's say, 10 lives. And if you multiply that times the 180 medical students or the 94 dental students or whatever the case may be, then within their lifetimes, that's a heck of a contribution. People who choose to donate, they have always been giving people their entire lives. It didn't just start because they came down with a terminal illness. And I think that their way of thinking is simply, I'm going to continue to give. I'm not going to let death stand in my way, take my body, um, do the most that you can that will help the most people that you can. Certainly, anatomic donation can be motivated by an altruistic desire, and it serves a noble purpose. But there is a practical side, too. There is no cost whatsoever to the families or to the donor. Anatomical bequest is a gift, and as such, these programs generally pay for all costs associated with the transportation of the body within defined geographic areas and cremation of the body afterwards. Cremains can be returned to the family or interred at a local columbarium. With the average funeral costing over $8,000, the economic benefit is obvious, but whole body donation can relieve family stress at a critical time. Dan Morell's father was a merry donor. We were able to, we had a memorial service for my father, um, and then my mother was able to 
to step back and take some time. Uh, the stress of making those decisions immediately was gone. It also gave my mother uh, some, some peace of mind in knowing that she would eventually have the opportunity to decide where my father's final resting place was. And she, in she involved me and my sister in that process. Like his father, Dan has decided to donate his body to Mary. It's a gift, to use the old and trite phrase, it's a gift that keeps on giving. And it's one that I hope people will seriously consider because it's something that, uh, that any of us can do for the future. For more information about these whole body donation programs, you can go to their websites to explore their similarities and differences. Both websites have downloadable anatomical bequest forms which do not require notarization. Until recently, the words adult and coloring book would never have appeared in the same sentence. But today, adult coloring books have become a trend. Adults of all ages are taking crayons, colored pencils, and felt tip markers, and filling in the blank spaces on intricate designs. For many, it's a way to relieve the stress and worry of everyday life. And like mindfulness or meditation, it allows us to focus solely on the present moment. If you're ready for some art therapy, grab some colored pencils and prepare to relive the simplicity and happiness of being six years old again. At an East Memphis home, members of the Water Christian Church congregation are having a paint party. But before they put brush to canvas, they're warming up their creative juices and having fun with adult coloring books. Local artist Michael Moffat is leading this group, and like everyone else, this is his first experience with this new trend. Uh, I like the adult coloring books. It's fun. Time will fly by. You think two hours gone by, you look up at the window and it's dark outside. Creativity, I love it. <laughs> Across the city in a midtown studio, artist and textile designer Janine Morrison is coloring too. But Janine is an old hand at this. Back in 2012, she happened to find one of her childhood coloring books. And um, when I saw it, I just realized like, I want to make one of these. I haven't colored in a long time. I always liked coloring. I just, I want to make one. So I um, looked through my portfolio and I gathered um, as much artwork as I had produced. And then I picked out, like for the last few years, then I picked out like the best designs that I had that I thought would work for coloring. Um, my husband had just read about CreateSpace, which is Amazon's self-publishing platform for printed books. So um, within three weeks of the time of having the idea for the coloring book, I had it um, put together and published and available for sale on Amazon. Janine didn't realize it at the time, but she was in the forefront of the adult coloring book craze. Over the course of two years, she published four books with modest sales, but then in 2014, things changed dramatically. I started getting almost like urgent messages from a publisher in France. The um, coloring book trend had taken off over there and they saw my coloring books and wanted to produce them in France. So it was a big thing happening over there and it hadn't even hit the United States yet. By 2015, the adult coloring book trend had crossed the ocean to America and Janine was in the perfect position to surf that wave. My best selling book, my flower designs coloring book, um, climbed all the way to number 16 on the Amazon bestseller list and it stayed in the top 100 for over eight weeks. Janine draws on sketch pads or uses computer software to create her designs, which are filled with intricate patterns that are perfect for detailed coloring. To date, she's produced about 14 adult coloring books which have been published here and overseas in France, Italy, and Brazil. It's very satisfying to take a pen and fill a space with color. 
In Arlington, Rachel Laughlin, a nurse in Methodist Hospital, is a passionate devotee of adult coloring books. But I've been a colorer my whole life, and I love to stay in the lines and, you know. Now that adult coloring books are available everywhere, Rachel doesn't have to shop in the children's section anymore. She enjoys books that have larger designs, but is very serious about staying within the lines. She uses mostly colored pencils, but also employs gel ink pens to give her artwork that extra touch of creativity. She enjoys coloring so much that she describes it as an obsession. Every single night when I get home from work after I've eaten dinner and I'm kind of winding down to go to bed, even if it's 10 minutes, I will color just a little bit, just to, just to color. It's an addiction. It's, it's really an addiction, but I could be addicted to worse things. <laughs> Whether you're coloring bold pictures or intricate designs, there's no questioning the enthusiasm of the participants. But scientists tell us there's more to adult coloring books than meets the eye. They can be a great stress reliever. When I was in nursing school and would be really stressed out in nursing school, which was basically most of the time I was in nursing school, I would lay on the floor in my parents' house where I lived at the time and color. That's how I de-stressed myself. So even as an adult then, I found pleasure and comfort in coloring. There's something so satisfying about just, just putting a pen on paper and the way the ink, the paper soaks up the ink. It is like, um, like you're the artist, like you've got this, this canvas, but it's not a blank canvas. You've got some guides, but every single image is different. So now I've been coloring for, you know, four years on a regular basis, and it's very calming. It's very relaxing. Researchers at the Cleveland Clinic have explored what can be called the zen of adult coloring books and identified three reasons that this activity relaxes people. Attention flows away from ourselves and we focus solely on the moment, very much like a mindful or meditative state. Because it's a simple activity, it relaxes the brain. And being a low stakes activity, it's more pleasurable. Even if you color outside the lines, nobody cares. It's art therapy. You don't really have to exercise massive brain energy to do it and there's just something cathartic about just that that motion is just it's cathartic it's just you and the page like you're just really really focused it's a nice time to just like have to yourself you're you're looking to you know put put the put the ink in the little square um, i can I can focus on this and kind of tune other things out. So will adult coloring books become the jigsaw puzzles of the boomer generation? Instead of hunting for the next piece of the puzzle, will we be choosing just the right color to complete our design? Trends come and go, but there is something special about revisiting a moment from our childhood. And that is why you can color these people happy. Life is more fun with color. Recently, the Centers for Disease Control reported that nearly three out of every four adults has a heart that is statistically older than the rest of their body. For men, the average was about eight years. For women, about five and a half years. One in four deaths in this country is a result of heart disease, many of them heart attacks. But there are some simple things you can do to lessen your risk. Maybe it's time to listen to your heart. What is a heart attack? The heart gets blood through the coronary arteries. So these are small, teeny tiny vessels, a small, smaller than this pancreas. The coronary arteries are really small. And these arteries get the blood to the muscle of the heart. When these arteries get blocked, you have a heart attack. And the heart attack basically is a muscle damage to the heart muscle. 
So if you have a muscle damage because the blood is not flowing well, because the oxygen is not going well, the part of this heart, of this muscle, dies. That's why it's extremely important to get on those really quick. What causes an arterial blockage? So they're extremely important for a healthy heart to have the coronary arteries to be open and patent. What can block it? A thrombus, a clot, plaque that builds up. It's like you, you clog your pipe. What clogs the pipe? Back again, smoking, smoking, smoking. Cholesterol, of course, other risk factors, genetics we talked about, but smoking, smoking, smoking. What are the signs of a heart attack? So the, the classic is that pain in the middle of the chest called angina pectors. And usually it would radiate to the left arm. Usually it would go down the left arm, numbness. So sometimes patients think it's just a nerve or they're not sure. So that's the classic. Now, along with this, shortness of breath. They, they, they're very hard to catch their breath. Uh, nausea, they get sick in the stomach. They get sweaty. So these are the classic signs of a heart attack. What is a silent heart attack? So silent heart attack is actually, uh, I call it the tricky heart attack because it's, it's more common in, in women and in diabetics. So what is a silent heart attack? It's a heart attack that does not present with the classic signs and symptoms that I was just describing earlier. It, it, the patient would not have that typical heaviness in the, in the middle of the chest. Actually, they can present with indigestion. And that's the most common simulator or the silent heart attack simulator that worries me a lot. Sometimes very vague symptoms, like just feeling a little sick, having flu-like symptoms, and you're not sure what that is, feeling tired. And again, extreme of, extremes of age, women, uh, diabetics, uh, where they have some nerve endings problems, so they don't have the typical pain that, that a, a usual person would, would have. Who is at risk? So risk factors. That's very important because that's something maybe we can control. Some of it is out of our hands, like genetics. We can talk about this a little bit. Basically, if you are from a family of heart disease where it's common, you, you, especially if it's at a younger age, if a patient comes and tells me, my dad died at the age of 30 or 35 from a heart attack. That's definitely a risk factor. But there is nothing we can do about this. High blood pressure, that's part of the risk factors, genetics. Also partly controlled by diet, but, but partly just uh, you're born with this. You have to, to uh, work on it and work with your doctor. Now, diabetes obviously is another very important risk factor. Having said all that, the most important is smoking, smoking, smoking. And this is in our hands. We can control smoking. I can quit smoking and it's going to help a lot. If you combine smoking with family history of heart disease or genetics, it's a bad comb. The steps to preventing a heart attack are simple. Quit smoking. Know your numbers, your body mass index and metabolic index. Exercise. Eat a healthy, low-fat diet. Drink alcohol in moderation. Avoid stress whenever possible. And laugh a lot. The simple act of laughing will cause the lining of the coronary arteries to expand. For more information on heart health, go to the website of the American Heart Association. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources.
and send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.